In the later 16th century, about a century after the introduction of print, Renaissance humanists evolved a novel literary genre, the essay. The name itself was probably coined by the French thinker Michel de Montaigne. He felt he needed a written mode which would allow him to capture his own thoughts on important subjects, to test their validity, to speculate about their deeper meanings, and to accomplish all this in a fashion that both pleased his readers and instructed them. So Montaigne invented the essay, or attempt, from a French verb meaning to try. It was a very appropriate choice, for Montaigne was really trying, and that's the key word, to clarify his thoughts. His essays are steps along the road to understanding, not understanding itself. There is nothing really finished about them. They are speculative probes into the unknown, risky forays into possible worlds, brave excursions into what might be. What is said in them may be true, or it may not be true. This is really for others to decide. And that, of course, is the point. To set forth what he believes might be the case so that others may consider it. The essay is not only an exercise in exploration, but in collaboration as well. And here we come to an important consideration. Montaigne and those essayists who followed him, Francis Bacon being first among them, knew very well that if you wanted people to think with you, you had to be brief, but not too brief. Montaigne looked around him at the genres made available by print and didn't like what he saw. On the one hand, he had books of proverbs, maxims, and aphorisms. Pithy sayings were all the rage in the Renaissance, probably because they were easy to remember and could make pretentious courtiers look smarter than they were. But they were often so short and so catchy that they stymied thought. A saying like, a stitch in time saves nine, doesn't invite you to reconsider something, but rather reinforces what everybody, including you, already knew. On the other hand, Montaigne had shelves full of weighty treatises, discourses, and dissertations. But these were too long to hold the interest of any but the most devoted scholars or leisure gentlemen. Nobody really read them. So the early Renaissance essayist designed a piece of writing that was not adapted to the narrow confines of human memory, like the proverb, or to the far reaches of human endurance, like the dissertation, but rather tailored to the brief but not too brief attention span of readers with a bit of spare time on their hands. Just how long brief but not too brief was depended on the essayist. Bacon's essays tend to be on the short side. His piece, Of Truth, contains just under 900 words. Montaigne's tend to be longish. His essay, On Cannibals, runs about 6,000 words. But whether short or long, the essay was very convenient. Some could be read in a few minutes, for example, while you waited for the kettle to boil. Others in an hour, the amount of time that you might have before you fall asleep. The essay, in a word, fit who we are and life as we lived it. It's little wonder, then, that essays became incredibly popular and still are. In fact, most of the things we read on a day-to-day -day basis are essays, or at least essay-esque. Newspaper and magazine articles, reports and briefings, memos and letters, all of them bear the mark of the essay. Yet it would be hard to deny that the essay is changing. And the reason is plain, the internet. The web offers many new opportunities for people to write, publish, and read essays. You can find millions of them in online magazines, personal blogs, and community discussion sites. But perhaps the most curious, and certainly the most novel, internet essays are those found on video sharing sites such as YouTube, or on video blogs, or vlogs, as they are called by those in the know. These are essays such as Montaigne and Bacon never imagined, because they are not intended to be read. No, their authors want you to watch and listen to them. We should recognize them for what they are. Video essays, a new promising variation on an old form. There is no doubt video essays have a bright future, and for a reason Montaigne and Bacon would understand intuitively. Recall that they designed the written essay to be easy to digest. Well, the video essay is even easier to digest. Homo sapiens were not evolved to read. We have no reading organ. In order to read, we have to laboriously rewire organs that were designed for other purposes. We have to teach our eyes and brains to do things that Mother Nature never intended. Reading is, therefore, hard. So hard that millions of people never learn to do it at all, even when given the opportunity, and billions more avoid it whenever they can. Homo sapiens were, however, evolved to watch and listen, as we can see from the fact that we have very nicely engineered watching and listening organs, that is, eyes and ears. Watching and listening are therefore very easy for us. Nearly everyone can do them without any special training or equipment. And what is more, we clearly like to do them. The bottom line is this. Watching and listening are, for most normal people, a lot more fun than reading. Now you may think this is good, or you may think it's bad. I'll confess that I have, or rather had, a reflexive bias against video and for writing. But like it or not, it's the way things are. People are going to watch and listen, rather than read. 
You can't stop them, and neither can I. This being so, those of us interested in making sure that the public knows what it needs to know should probably listen to Montaigne and Bacon. In seeking to spread enlightenment, we should accommodate the reality of human preferences rather than railing against them. This project, Mechanical Icon, is a step in that direction. You might think of it as a book of video essays, something like Montaigne's and Bacon's books of written pieces, but for the internet age. The short films that follow are essentially exploratory meditations on iconic images, speculative investigations of historic photographs that have become symbols of things larger than themselves. They were chosen precisely because they are very well known. You've probably seen most of them. This familiarity gives us, the essayist and the audience, a common point of departure for our exploration. In the voiceovers, I'll tell you what I think the images mean. That is, I'll render interpretations. No doubt I'll be wrong about a lot of things, and you will justifiably disagree with some of what I have to say. But that's really the object, to challenge you to think about these familiar objects of our collective experience, to consider and reconsider what they and the events they represent mean for our common enterprise. By drawing all these things to mind, by thinking them through, by turning them over and over again, we accomplish just what Montaigne and Bacon intended. We become more human. A final note. We have already completed a number of the video essays, and I hope you find them rewarding. Over the course of the next few months, we will be adding more of them. Eventually, there will be about 200 on the site. If you have something to say about any of them, or the project of which they are a part, please feel free to contact me at marshallpoe at gmail.com. I can also be reached at the Department of History at the University of Iowa. I hope you enjoy what you find at Mechanical Icon, and I look forward to hearing from you.